Hi, this is Yaro Stark. Welcome to another Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. Uh, tonight I have a special guest with me named Brian Clark. Um, you'll probably know Brian Clark already from copyblogger.com. If not, uh, you should go to copyblogger.com. He's currently uh, rocking up the, the blog charts in terms of subscription numbers and, and readership and hitting top ten lists all over the place. So uh, thanks for joining me tonight, Brian. Thanks, Yaro. Glad to be here. Uh, as per usual, we're just going to go through uh, a bit of your history, Brian, and find out how you got to where you are. And I'm, I'm really curious. Um, you pretty much came out of nowhere for in one, in, um, my sort of exposure to the blogosphere. I, I track a lot of people, and your blog just suddenly became big. So I'm curious to figure out where you got all the knowledge that you have been dishing out in your blog posts. You must have a lot of um, business experience, certainly copywriting experience. So can we go back to maybe as far as your studying days and just give me a quick run through how you got to where you are? Okay. Um, there was college and law school. A lot of, uh, lot of fun and not as much studying, but I did okay. Um, got out of law school, practiced law, did not like it at all. Um, Basically spent um, all my time that I wasn't working trying to figure out what else I was going to end up doing. Um, about 1997, I moved to Austin. Um, kind of dramatically just up and quit my big law firm job. Uh, that was kind of a reckless decision, but it luckily turned out okay. I uh, moved to Austin. Um, actually was considering becoming a screenwriter. I've always kind of had a thing for writing, and uh, I had this, you know, starving artist uh, mentality all of a sudden, which is very difficult to uh, go from <laughs> a cushy law job. <laughs> but uh, moved down there, and, um, of course, it was just the beginning of the dot-com boom, the first, you know, the, uh, the nefarious Web 1.0, as it's now known. Um, but I had been online basically since day one of the of the uh, you know of the web itself. I, I did not participate much. You know, I, I really didn't get into computers at all. Um, but I had been a big fan of people like William Gibson and whatnot in the 80s, and they talked about cyberspace and whatnot. And once it became easy to get on, um, I was right there, fascinated by it, and also fascinated by the fact that it seemed like it was just an outstanding uh, medium in order to make money, to, you know, reach out to people and, and build a business. Mm -hmm. um, so I, Are you talking like 1994, 1993 when you found the internet? It was probably December of 94, I think, is when, wow. I, yep. when I first got this really hideous compact computer um, and an AOL account. And, uh, you know, it, it took me about five minutes to figure out AOL was not the internet. <laughs> back, in, back in those days, the internet was weird because they had all sorts of weird stuff like Archie and Veronica and all these files, server things, and Usenet was the equivalent of the blogosphere. And uh, right, yeah. it, it was a very <laughs> strange place, but fascinating at the same time. It hasn't really changed all that much, really, when you think about it. It really it's hasn't when you think about it. It's a little bit easier to get around, but ultimately I think it's the same deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, um, moved to Austin. Every people were internet crazy. Austin is a big became a big technology town thanks to Dell and uh, a lot of other tech companies. And basically, here's the short answer to your question about how I basically got the knowledge. I was really big into email publishing. The the first thing that I got into was publishing e-zines. And I was inspired a lot by Chris Perillo's Locker Gnome. Um, it was just fascinating to me that you could publish an email and receive a thousand dollars for an advertisement that you put in it. I mean, I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I started up various e-zines with various degrees of success, but my real success was starting up a legally related. In, it, it was a legal newsletter e-zine um, that talked about online advertising issues and that was just the right match at that time and I got tons of business, got totally integrated into what was going on in the Austin tech scene um, and 
it was interesting. I was advising startups as a lawyer, but I was also acting as a marketing consultant because I understood the space and they didn't. And it, it just was really an interesting time. Had a great time, lots of parties, lots of excess, and then in 2000, everything fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you could call this your consulting uh, years or months, right? The period where you, you mostly did consulting for your income? Uh, yeah, right? pretty much. I mean, f frankly, we were all making it up as we went along. I mean, you know, it was a totally new medium, but you just tried to apply existing principles and, and make your way through it. There was much more uh, just kind of pie-in-the-sky attitudes uh, going on at that time. People thought the fundamental laws of economics had somehow learned not to apply, um, you know, and that e-commerce was somehow changed the rules of supply and demand. It just didn't work out that way, but it was a very heady period. Um, and, and were you actually an owner of any of these, you know, dot-com bubble bursting companies that were affected, or were you just consulting? No, them? I had my own little projects going on, but they were fairly, um, they were always publishing related. I never tried to do the big grand plan. I was frankly too busy right. shaking my head at other people's business models. Um, I remember one of the last right. things I did, uh, there was a, a company called Living.com, and they uh, figured that they were going to supply all the furniture in the planet over their website. You know, no, it never occurred to them that most people don't like to buy furniture without sitting on it and touching it. <laughs> but uh, I got them out of their office lease the day before they declared bankruptcy, and that was pretty much the uh, <laughs> that was at the end. <laughs> that was when we packed up and moved back to Dallas. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing what what people were spending money on back then. It really was. In the sky the investment was crazy. I mean, anyone with an idea. Uh, with a dot com attached to it was getting money, and you know it was easier to make money really by advising people and trying to help them out uh, than ultimately it turned out to be profitable for a lot of those companies. Mm -hmm. and, and you emerged from this reasonably unscathed. Well, we did or? have you know when everything dried up, there was no more legal work, there was no more you know internet consulting work. Um, Austin was really Austin was really at the time a university town that became a tech hub, but it was totally dependent on the technology boom. And so when that went away, a lot you know the economy suffered, the real estate market kind of crashed. Um, we were lucky to sell our home and and get out before that happened. But uh, basically, we went back to Dallas, which is a much more mature, broad city. I gotta stop you, Brian. When you say we, you're talking about your family, right? Yeah, my wife. Okay. Yeah, that was before the children. Right, because <laughs> we're not talking about business partners here or anything like that. We're talking about family. Right. Okay. Continue. Um, so at that time, I took what I knew about the Internet, and, at, and that's when I became really kind of schooled in direct marketing. Um, it's interesting, if, if you look at the history of what happened at that time, everyone thought the Internet was dead, and, of course, it, it was for these outlandish companies who thought they were going to rule the world and sell dog food to everyone, like Pets.com. Mm -hmm. But the direct marketers, you know, everything from individuals to larger companies just applied basic principles of selling directly. You know, that can range everything from Dell and Geico to, um, you know, the, the junk mail that you might receive. You know, mm -hmm. there's a whole spectrum of the direct marketing industry. But that's really what the Internet is, if you think about it. It's a way to communicate directly with prospects um, rather than necessarily having to go through a media company. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been extrapolated to the point where we are today, which is social media, where kind of all of us are the media to a certain degree, and we kind of participate and decide. And filter. Right. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it really makes, if you, if you look at it from that standpoint, it's all been a nice kind of gradual evolution. I know that now the mainstream media is picking up on Web 2.0 like it just popped out of nowhere. Yeah, but no. if you kind of uh, paid attention, it all built on one step after another. So I started a couple of companies. Um, I was, you know, resolved not to ever go back to practicing law. 
Um, so I got into real estate, which of course was big at the you know the first half of this decade. Um, did very well with that. Totally, completely built both businesses online. Never any offline marketing whatsoever. And okay, so these are real estate businesses with online marketing. Right. Exactly. Okay. okay. Which it, it, there was a big shift at that time towards. You know, if you were ahead of the curve, it was really like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, yeah. Because using paperclip. Yeah, in the day. exactly. Yeah. Back in the days when paperclip was easy, you know, and you didn't even have to think about it like you do with Google AdWords now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's very complicated and competitive now. Back then, it was not at all. Um, but luckily, most people in that industry had no idea about any of that. So that was kind of an advantage. And from there, I just started continuing to do my own kind of internet pure play projects, uh, collaborating on information products with various people, affiliate marketing. Basically, I love the marketing more right. than anything. We, you know, I was just going to say, it, it sounds like you're almost breaking the rule. You're being a, a jack-of-all-trades business person because... You're really dipping your your fingers into all different types of niches all over the place here. Yeah, it's so easy with the internet to have an idea and to try it out. Right, and that's really the wonderful thing about the medium, and that's why there's so many people that can start out really with very little, no capital, just time, effort, and a good idea, and they can make something of it. I mean, Darren Rouse is a great example of that uh, with ProBlogger. He did not, you know, didn't have a lot of money. In fact, was juggling part-time jobs while he, you know, made blogging a mm-hmm. career. And he stumbled you know, upon success. He really did. So, <laughs> yeah, he worked very hard for it. But, you know, he's built something that's going to continue to grow, and he never, you know, had to worry about startup money or okay. anything like that. And I think, of course, that is a double-edged sword. Um, anyone can get rich but not everyone will. You know, it's always been mm. like that. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity, and with social media, and, you know, that's why I started Copy Blogger to kind of bring it all together, was I realized that traffic has always been the hard thing, you know, getting enough traffic. Pay-per-click was amazing because it was a return on investment deal where you you pay you could pay a thousand dollars and make ten thousand dollars that's very <laughs> amazing compared match. to most forms of advertising um, but of course like we like we mentioned it's it's a different game these days you know everyone when you have a good thing everyone will figure it out I think we're seeing that now with like dig <laughs> you know I mean you know people have figured out that hey if I write a certain type of content um, I can get ten thousand people to my website today that's fairly uh, powerful. Okay, well, I, I want to go back a bit. You you started doing email newsletters before it became a stock standard thing to do in the online world. Did you carry through all those newsletter businesses or projects through to today? Like, to, are any of them still running now, or have you sold them off? Or? No, um, I would say that my early my early e-zine projects, um, some of which I started and abandoned. Others were critically acclaimed and made no money. <laughs> okay. um, I had one in particular that was a movie review e-zine. I, I got all sorts of great press. I was in Entertainment Weekly. I was a you know, feature story in the Austin Chronicle, Sight and Sound magazine, all over the place. A right. um, lot of fun. Didn't, at that time, I didn't understand how to make that into what I could do with it today. Now, of course, starting a movie review e-zine today would be futile because, <laughs> you know, that, that space is pretty filled up, right? Yeah. Um, but so I think those early projects made me very pragmatic for a, a very, you know, a period of time, and I used what I had learned to sell services, and it was, again, it was just like shooting fish in a barrel because no right. one really understood it. Um, you had visionaries like Chris Perillo who were able to charge a thousand or two thousand dollars for an email advertisement. At that time, I was not able to achieve that. But what I did was just take the exact same marketing concepts of 
subscriber value, uh, compelling content, et cetera, and then use that to build um, first a law practice, then a couple of real estate brokerages, and then from there, I had the confidence to start going back to pure Internet-only stuff. But instead of advertising, I became more of a direct marketing type. Okay. So your little projects, or your big projects in some cases, were you the only one writing those newsletters and, and setting things up from a technical standpoint? Or did you, were you hiring back then? How big were No, you, you know what? And I probably should have, but I always wrote. I love that end of it. Um, almost, you know, I was always responsible for being the rainmaker because I knew how you could talk to people, for example, the people I needed to hire and work with in real estate had no idea what I did. They were just happy that it worked, right? Right, because yeah. you were generating leads for them, exactly. right? Exactly. And, I, was, and I'm, okay. I have always been rather bad at delegating, and that's something that I need to continue to work on. Um, I'm fascinated by the ability, specifically with copywriting and direct marketing, how you can write one piece, one sales piece, and, you know, fortunes have been made off of that. That's a yeah. fascinating thing. I've, I've done quite well with several promotions. Um, I've never hit one individual just out of the park home run. But I think that is what's so fascinating about it, that you never know. You know, the, the reality is most successful people online do project after project after project, and it builds and builds and builds. And that's, I always... I'm all, every time I have an idea that I'm working on, it has to be home run quality to me, but I fully expect that it won't be. It'll just do well. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I, I think that's so, the, the way to go about it because I've never had much luck with anything that uh, I wasn't passionate about. Right. Well, the good thing is you're taking action at least, so you do create the chance for it to go big that's if nothing else. Literally 80 to 90 percent of it. I mean, having great ideas. You know, I have them left and right, but if you don't act on them, they're no good at all. Okay, so if we took a snapshot then, Brian, of, of what you are today, I know you can't talk about every single project you're doing, but can you just give me a quick run-through of, of what's on your books today as current for Brian Clark? Well, the, we have the, the public projects. Like you said, I, I, I've always been behind the scenes, or m more likely not necessarily behind the scenes, but I, I created local businesses. Um, and then from there, I would do joint ventures. And my model, it's not really a, a secret, but for example, let's say you, you're seeing a trend in a certain area of, say, the health and wellness industry, um, and you realize that there's a need that's not being filled, be, perhaps because the people with the credentials to do that uh, you know, have no clue about internet marketing or how to make a product or, or whatever the case may be. So essentially you can, you know, find something that needs, you know, a market need and then contact someone and say, hey, are you interested in doing this? I, I, I know the ropes. I can put this together. You know, all I need to do is let's get together and create something. Uh, usually the easiest thing to do is something like we're doing right now. You know, get someone to interview the expert according to a, a script, and you have an audio product uh, at the end of that. Not that this is scripted or anything, but... Well, you, what I'm saying is just... <laughs> but I know, you I know can what you create mean. a valuable production. product by just talking to, you know, a conversation between two people, right? right? Uh, and usually, you know, from my standpoint, that was always you did need a certain set of questions in order to extract what needed to come out. Of right? course, right. So is that what you're doing now? You have partnerships with various experts in different niches. You provide, say, the internet marketing acumen and implementation, and they provide the content creation? Would that be I think that fair? it's fair to say that I'm enjoying some passive revenue at this time. Also, the, uh, the sale of my last business, um, because when... Basically, when at the end of last year is when I swore off any more offline business activities. Never say right. never, of course, but that's my call. Um, <laughs> and that's what really led me to kind of go ahead and, and start Copy Blogger. I, 
I've never really had any aspirations to be some internet marketing guru, and I'm still I'm not even sure I'm comfortable with this role. But I knew there were very exciting things going on online. Um, I could see that coming, I, just like I saw it last time. It's different this time. There's more power in individuals and small groups than there are in these 10 or $20 million venture capital funded things. We're still seeing some companies get VC money, you know, uh, good for them, I guess. I'm not, I just, I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, usually if you've got a good idea, it's either going to get traction or it's not. And uh, I see value in uh, taking money after uh, the crowd has determined that this is something they're interested in. But I, I don't think I would ever advise anyone to take funding based on an idea and then go out there and launch because it's just not necessary. And you and you become very uh, blinded to what people actually want. When you when you have money and an idea and a plan, you tend to try to just relentlessly implement it. When you don't throw money into a project and you and you know, you it obviously takes money to do anything to a certain degree. I'm talking about substantial amounts of money. Um you know if you're forced to really give people what they want in order to be successful, I mean, that's really the key of all successful businesses. Like Paul Graham says, make something people want, right? Uh, you can do that these days, you know, uh, even with, you know, obviously 37 Signals, good example there, a lot of um, Web 2.0 company successes. A lot of them are going to be failures, though, because they may have the capacity to create a nice web-based application, but nobody wants it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or there's no way to keep it perpetually funded. Right. With whatever. Right. There's no way to eventually future. monetize it. You know. I mean, yeah. everyone so, is hoping to get acquired. Yahoo. I, <laughs> yeah. Yahoo buys audiences with Delicious and Flickr, but you know, I don't think they're. That's. And that's still the cream of the crop. We don't. There's how many little players are below them that are struggling right. to get through. It really, is a uh, you know the people that get the main attention are all, all we hear about throughout the day. And, so. and they're a very small minority. Um, yeah, and I've always, against my better judgment, I've always tended to be a content person. I always, that's what the kind of ideas I always come up with, and it generally works out for me. But um, as we've seen a lot lately, I think there was a great post by uh, Scott Carpet, Publishing 2.0, about how content doesn't scale. That's true. You know, content is labor-intensive. That's why user-generated content is, is such the hot thing. Hey, you know, mm-hmm. they're going to do it for us for free. Now, there's all sorts of fallacies in that model as well. Uh, most, most of the content's not that great, and the other half is copyright infringement, right? <laughs> But, uh, yeah, or it's very short-term but, thinking. I know a lot exactly. of people. But, you know, building a platform such as Dig or Delicious, uh, you know, that's true value. I just don't know how easy it is to replicate. And I don't think it should be something that's easy to replicate because, you know, there should be a few leaders in this area where the critical mass goes to. Like, you, can't, you don't want to have, I don't think, 10 Ebays running at the one time because you're not going to get a top quality that one eBay right. offers. It's okay to have three or four, perhaps, but you, know, you only get too many. But this is a, a good tie into what you've done with Copy Blur. You're talking about providing something that people wanted, and you certainly hit the nail on the head with Copy Blogger. Now, you're not the only blogger who wrote about, um, say, copywriting or writing in general or blog traffic, and yet you really skyrocketed to the front of the field. I know you've, you've answered the question already before of what you think it is that you did that was unique to get you to where you are, which was to create content that people generally wanted and to focus on your readers' needs. So I won't ask you that question, <laughs> but maybe you could elaborate a bit more on uh, just a few, you know, I don't want to call them insider secrets, but thoughts on what it takes to get a blog, you know, to a uh, 5,000 a day readership as opposed to where most bloggers are sitting on that 500 a day readership. You know, the, the 
the, the critical mass that you're the you're in the upper echelon area, which is very hard to reach. So what do you think's key? Well, you know, when I started the blog, I thought it was a good idea. I thought it was an, a unique um, combination of elements combining traditional copywriting with blogging and social media uh, because it just it was something that occurred to me, you know. Instead of SEO copywriting, which is keyword stuffing, or at least it used to be, now you have a, uh, an older form of copywriting uh, applied in a new way. And I just thought that was a good idea and a good way to get across the point, the main point, that is, if you know, you always have to focus on them. It's, it's just the fundamental first rule of business as far as I'm concerned, and certainly of marketing. Um, but when I started Copyblogger, the, the idea was this. I'm going to talk about this subject matter, and I'm going to be practicing what I preach on my readers. And it's either going to demonstrate in real time for everyone that it works, or no one's going to read me. And, you know, everything will work itself out really fast. And luckily... <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is yet another project that you attempted to see whether it would stick sure. or not. And yeah, and stuff. of course, you know, with blogging, you can't just okay. try it for a month or, you know, and and you have to have signs of encouragement, I would say, but you can't expect yeah. to just rock it to the top of the charts. I mean, uh, it, it just doesn't work <laughs> that way. But you do have to see, I think, signs that you're making progress uh, in order to keep going. But... If there's anything that I think is is the secret to copy blogger success, I think it was it's just the realization. A lot of times when I talk to readers over IM or email, they seem to really get a kick because they know that what I'm teaching by doing, um, you know, it's it's yeah, it's a lovely bit of social proofing in and of itself. They just yeah. get a kick that you know you can read the post, but the post itself is is working the way it's intended to um, you know I, it's kind of a meta situation but uh, yeah which could have backfired on you completely it, absolutely <laughs> it's very yeah. it, it's very tenuous ground really but uh, luckily it worked out okay so um, outside of copy blogger uh, what I'd like to know what's in the day of the life of Brian Clark and I know you work pretty hard at the moment because you you have quite a lot of writing gigs, I guess, to maintain. I know writing a blog, you know, in and of itself, is a big job. I'm spending a hell of a lot of time doing that, as well as writing information products behind the scenes. So, what are you doing in your, you know, your nine to five or nine to ten, whatever yeah. it is you? Nine work? to five, I wish. I don't know how I thought I was going to have more leisure time, you know, with this, but uh, it's my own choosing, so it's okay. Um, since September, well, really. For a couple months before September, a lot of time has been taken up by Tutorial, which is our video site that I partner with Chris Pearson on. Um, Tutorial.com? Tutorial, yes. .com, yeah. And uh, that is a whole different ballgame. Um, you know, I don't think people realize how much work it takes. And, and these are just screencast videos. You know, it's not like live video or anything like that. Um, but I know, for example, like Rocket Boom or Zay Frank, they literally spend six to eight hours a day <laughs> just getting that one three-minute clip out. Um, so it's fairly labor-intensive. Of course, the rewards can uh, can be great. Tutorial is actually doing very well. Unlike Copyblogger, it was designed to make money from day one, and it has... Um, uh, both from sponsorships and AdSense and affiliate links, you know. Uh, when you start off without obvious monetization, it, uh, you know, I, I think it can help you build readership to a certain degree, but then once you, you start to bring things in, you have to be very strategic about it um, so as not to alienate your, your readers. Luckily, I've been able to do that slowly at Copyblogger because, it's never been a priority. Copyblogger really was intended to get myself known and and be able to meet people like yourself and, you know, just dozens of other people that are doing interesting things online. It's almost worked too well because I've gotten to the point that I, I'm 
for a while there, I was kind of overwhelmed. You know, a lot of people had good ideas. They wanted to joint venture, work on this project, et cetera. And uh, I had to really cut back on that because it it was getting to the point that there were so many possibilities that nothing was getting done. Right. Have you hired an email manager yet? <laughs> Gosh, that will probably be the first thing that I do. Um, <laughs> At, at this point, I've just become very bad at email. Yeah. <laughs> and I warn people. You know, I, just say, Look, I may not get back to you for a while. <laughs> yeah. It's scary when you have to devote a weekend to responding to your emails or something like that, which I found myself right. doing lately. So. But, yeah, you know, trying to keep up with email, I, I think being engaged in my comment section and answering emails and, reaching out to people and, you know, all that kind of stuff is, I think that's been a part of um, how well Copy Blogger has done. It, it takes a lot of work, but I really do enjoy it. Um, sometimes I have to say, look, you know, you need to focus a little bit more on on what's paying the bills. And, you know, I do that all the time. It, it, I end up working more. Um but th- this year, I kind of knew once Copy Blogger started to take off that I was going to be busy. I was going to be working a lot. Um, I think there's a lot going on right now. I think this is a good particular time to be working hard. So and, you know, and how does how does the wife feel about you working so hard? She well. She just went back to work recently um, after staying home several years with the children, uh, not really because she had to, but because, you know, <laughs> she was uh, just missing her professional life. And um, so now she's back to working, which just makes it more crazy. Um, but uh, she doesn't mind me working, you know, um, any more than I mind her working. We just have to make sure that things get taken care of. Right. You don't have the advantages like I do of, of being a single guy. So I could, we can totally lose myself in work and then I have to slap myself to get out of there. <laughs> when I was a young single okay. guy, I didn't work enough, I'm afraid. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm being smart. I, don't yeah, know. I think you are. <laughs> Time will tell. You, you've done quite a bit um, more than most people your age accomplish. Actually, more than cool. some people my age accomplish, so I wouldn't worry. <laughs> right. You're on the right track. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm curious, Brian, what, what you were talking about, your bread and butter. Is is it, I know uh, tutorials is just getting started, so that's probably not a significant portion yet, but is, are you still doing a lot of consulting, or, or what do you? What can you talk about in terms of your income at the moment? Um, I have uh, two, com- you know, I, I explicitly state on, on the blog that I don't, You know, I'm not really for hire. That's not what I'm... And I certainly... I've had people... (laughs) Most amazing... Not even requests. They were almost like demands. I need this press release done by tomorrow. I'll give you $100. (laughs) The first (laughs) response that I wanted to send, I didn't. (laughs) But I politely (laughs) told them uh, the same thing, which is, no way. (laughs) Um, What if they said $10,000? Oh, sure, for $10,000, a press release, I could squeeze that in. But, you know, most people terribly undervalue good writing, um, and I'm just not about to even entertain that because I don't have to. Um, And and you never thought of being like a, you know, a a Dan Kennedy or a a Martin, um, sorry, forgetting the names, copyright, Dan Kennedy, Michael Fortin, um, Gary Halbert, these sort of professional copywriters, because they get paid sort of ten thousand dollars for a sales page sort of right. area. Not I've, ever been I've, I've gotten, a, you know, I've done a few of those, um, but my my passion is more about starting up businesses and projects. Uh, I don't want to just be the guy who writes the words. In fact, mm-hmm. I'm getting closer and closer to hiring out my own copywriting. <laughs> I mean, I really enjoy doing it. I always have done it. Uh, I always write everything, basically, related to any project I'm doing. I finally started letting Pearson write his own copy on tutorial, Um, (laughs) just because he's good at it, you know. But I I enjoy doing it. But um, it's getting to the point where I would like to... I've got, okay, I've got two 
major projects going right now that are live. Um, I've got several things that are kind of in main, maintenance stage, I guess, from, from last year that, you know, you don't have to pay much attention to them. Um, Can you name these? Are these public? Or? Uh, the, the people that I have joint ventured with would not appreciate me naming it. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> their expertise and their product, and they don't necessarily want me saying that right. I actually put it Oh, okay. Well, I thought we could help them make some sales, maybe, but if, it, if, it's, <laughs> right. if it's not related to well, internet marketing. It would. I don't know. <laughs> Find a strategic way to do that. Yeah. But, uh, that, you know, with my, my background, what most people call joint venturing these days is just a glorified affiliate program, okay? It's, it's really a bastardization of the word. I learned about joint ventures from practicing law. I mean, really sophisticated stuff, whether it be real estate development or business licensing, whatever, you know. The, this is the kind of stuff I worked on as an attorney. I didn't enjoy playing that role, I guess, any more than I would enjoy playing only a consultant role. I wanted to be, I wanted to be the guy making the deal, not the one papering the deal. Um, but that was an excellent background. So I, I routinely kind of get in the middle of stuff that makes money. Um, <laughs> That's how you're putting it. There's a deal closing this week that I did. You know, I helped a company build up a sales relationship with a electronic funding company and that company is getting acquired and we have an interest. You know, I mean, I don't like to talk about money because I think it's gauche, but, uh, you know, if you do that kind of stuff, you don't necessarily have to worry about, for example, slapping ads all over a uh, copy blogger or, uh, you know, trying to pitch something every week or every day. You know, you just don't have to do that. And that's a luxury, and I, I recognize that. Uh, I don't want to in any way belittle people that are trying to make money from what they're doing. In fact, I applaud them. Uh, there's just a way to do it, and there's a way not to. And I think I probably would have um, tried to do more with Copyblogger on a faster schedule if – if the money had been that much of a concern, but I, I had a luxury, and now I'm kind of scrambling, and it's more a matter of time, um, but I've got some ideas about sponsorships and whatnot, and, uh, you know, again, things that add value to the audience that also make me money. I mean, that's a win-win situation for everyone. So those are the type of things I want to implement. I think it's an important point when you talk about blogging with the the luxury of not having to focus too much on how you're going to make money from that because it allows you to be almost purely creative in, in what you write about and how you write about and when you write. And it just right. seems like it's a much more natural flow. And I know a lot of people get hung up on the blogging for dollars part of the uh, equation, which can ultimately be, I think, uh, a big detriment because it kills the motivation or doesn't kill it, but certainly makes it a bit misguided. And um, I think that, that if you're in a situation where you're doing something else that pays your bills and you can also blog and demonstrate your expertise as a side uh, project like that, like pretty much what you've been doing up to this point maybe, then, um, yeah, your best work certainly comes out that way, I think. Right. And, and just to be clear, for example, a lot of the people that I enjoy uh, or that I hope are reading Copyblogger, and I think they are, are more of the small business people um, that are promoting their existing business or a business that they're concurrently starting, which is very similar to the easing, uh, multiple easings that I've done to build my businesses. In that case, the whole reason why you're blogging is to promote your business. I mean, never be shy about that. But I think that's a very different situation than someone who's not necessarily just trying to attract consulting work or uh, sell a, an existing product that they might have. Um, it's when people are trying to monetize through other avenues. And, of course, you know, everyone is just enamored with uh, AdSense. And it, it's very, it's a very alluring program. Um, I would love to have a few websites that, you know, racked in all that AdSense income. Um I think it was a lot easier to do several years ago. It's not impossible now, 
but it's certainly not easy. You know, no, actually, I, I've um, only just recently acquired one website that was basically a set and, well, not set and forget, but it's a forum, so it runs itself, and it does make the majority of income from AdSense. And I've got that little Firefox extension on my browser down the bottom right corner that tells me every hour how much money I make. <laughs> I know, it's addictive, and, isn't it? Oh, it's terrible. It's <laughs> I spend so much headspace on that little counter just because it's there, that I, I, I'm thinking of taking it down because yeah. it's actually a big distraction. I mean, so. checking AdSense, checking affiliate stats, you know, the money's either there or it's not. And, and trust me, I'm just as bad as anyone because it's just fascinating, <laughs> you know. Any, yeah, compelling. Uh, whether it be checking, you know, ClickBank stats or, you know, shopping cart, <laughs> whatever. You know, there's all sorts of different ways you can make money. And the more ways you go about it, the worse it becomes. And um, I think the only saving grace I have at this point is there'd be too many things to check. I'd never get anything done because I, I'm sure there's – I checked a PayPal account today that I hadn't checked in a while, and there was money in it. I mean, a few thousand dollars. <laughs> you know how people say that <laughs> PayPal that money doesn't feel like real money? I was instantly yeah. thinking about, man, what can I buy with this? You know, instead of <laughs> – like it's five dollars yep. in my jeans, which you know, and I, I, yeah, yeah. I didn't come from a wealthy background, you know, so I don't have a uh, disrespect for money whatsoever. But you, you stumble across a PayPal account that you forgot about. That's like Christmas morning. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, so, so Brian, then where where are you going in the future? Where do you want to be? Where where's what's the plan? I, I know you don't want to work as hard as you're working at the moment. In the, the well, yeah, future. and I was heading in that direction, and and then I got sidetracked, which I often do. Okay, um, keep going. But yes, I've got several. You know, I would say at least two projects firmly on the uh, table for the beginning of 2007. Um, I will have an ebook for Copy Blogger, not uh, shortly, um, but I also am interested in doing. Um, more teleclass type stuff uh, from Copy Blogger. I think there's a lot of subject matter that can be covered. Um, I'm losing some interest in the ebook format. Um, I'm much more interested in more of an interactive audio or video environment. And then, of course, you can always package that up later and continue to uh, to sell it. So that that's on the plate. Uh, the other two projects are just completely independent um, blogging and podcasting projects that I'll, I'll probably be launching. Um, so I, I think there's two or three of those. And that'll pretty much be as much as I could possibly do on my own. Um, and some of these things actually are designed not to be about... Well, everything I do, you'll notice it never has my name front and center. I always create some kind of branded product or whatever, copy blogger, tutorial. It's always going to be that way uh, because building a strong personal brand is important, but building a brand that can be conveyed or taken over by someone else is, in my opinion, much more important to keeping your sanity and, if you're like me, moving on to the next deal. And so I guess to answer your question, uh, Part of why I'm so keen to be actively involved with the blogging community is because I view myself more as, as a producer type. Um, you know, with the legal background, a uh, lot of ideas, not enough time to implement them. It's time to collaborate at a, at a different level. Beyond the joint venture, more uh, into, you know, putting projects together with talented people and, again, same model. Does it fly or not? If so, let it roll. And I'd, I'd love to be able to do more of that per year than I'm capable of doing on my own. Okay, so you're not the kind of, I want to set up passive income and sit on the beach, uh, perpetual holiday kind of guy. You want to keep getting your hands dirty and more projects for the near-term future. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I made enough money from, from what I did last year to retire forever, but I could sit around for a while. That's just, it's not any fun um, for me. I, I like having the option, you know, the, the uh, 
some people refer to it differently, but we can call it go to hell money. Um, you know, <laughs> having passive income or, you know, uh, in, uh, money saved up gives you freedom. Um, to n- if you're unhappy, stop. And again, I've been in positions before where I couldn't stop. You know, I had, I had student loans to pay. Just, you know, everyone is to a varying degree in that situation. No one really likes it. Um, the, the first key is to love what you do. The second key is to try to continue to build trickles uh, or flows of income from various sources. Never put your eggs in all in one basket. Um, a lot of people do that with Google, and then they get slapped around when the algorithm changes. That's a scary idea. You know, if you enjoy not worrying when you go to sleep at night that you're going to, you know, if something gets cut off, there should be three or four other things that keep you going. And if you continually enjoy creating new things and seeing if they work, and if you're successful with some of those, uh, over time, it just works itself out. It really does. Well, I was going to say, I normally um, finish these by asking what would you recommend because the audience of these podcasts are small business owners and young entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general who may or may not have their own uh, enterprise already or certainly about to launch one or are interested in launching one in the near future. And I ask, what would you recommend to these people um, are the key to successes or how you'd go about launching a first project? But I think you, you kind of answered that already uh, in a general kind of way anyway. Do you have anything to add, perhaps, you know, if you were... Uh, just fresh out of university or high school or, you know, you're 20 something and you're about to start something online, what would you dip your toes into first up? Yeah, I, I really wish, you know, I was this guy back then. (laughs) (laughs) Again, and that's why, Yara, I think you're, you're really ahead of the curve and I hope a lot of your listeners are as well and that's, that's really cool. Um, I think there's more sources of this type of, information than ever. Um, you know, I, I think before the internet really exploded, most um, business advice was somewhat stuffy. Of course, you had your classics like, uh, you know, Think and Grow Rich and all that kind of stuff, but uh, those weren't on my radar at the time. <laughs> but um, I think from a general sense, it's it's important to, in, to really try to enjoy what you're doing and while you have the freedom and you're not locked into, um, you know, people uh, at a younger age think they're locked into and they can't do certain things. It only gets worse, okay? So the, the best <laughs> advice I can, I can so, give you... So optimistic, right? <laughs> well, it only gets worse from a responsibility standpoint, right? <laughs> um, I, the best advice I would give is... You know, be practical, look at a way that you can fill an actual need, tie it into a passion, and then take risk. Just try it, you know, just do it, uh, give it a shot. If you fail, you'll learn more than if, if you succeed. I failed tons of times. I learned, I still continue to fail. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about, of course. <laughs> there, there are always missteps. And as long as you figure out what was important to pick up from that, you'll just continue to grow. And that, that's all I can say. Um, and, again, I wish I had could tell myself this advice when I was 20 because I had that kind of mentality that you have to find one thing and it just takes off and that's what you do for the rest of your life. When you think about it, that's, that's kind of depressing. Yeah, it's certainly uh, restrictive yes. or very low pressure on yourself. There's so. a whole world of ways to make money. Find one that you are into and go with it, or 20 of them. But just tend to focus on one at a time. And that's where the interview with Brian Clark ends. I'd like to thank Brian for coming on my podcast. If you'd like to learn more about him, check out his blog, which is at copyblogger.com. And if you would like to listen to more podcasts like this, please visit my blog, which is entrepreneurs-journey.com, or do a Google search for my name, which is Yaro, Y-A-R-O.